by our program manager, Nick Horner. Feel free to post questions and comments there as well. Finally, um, we may discuss topics and ideas containing sensitive material. Let us remember to remain respectful, open, and growth-centered as a community. <laughs> At the place George Mason University occupies, we give, we give greetings and thanksgiving to these Potomac River life sources, the Manahoac ancestors, the Rappahannock, Pamunkey, Matapanai, Upper Matapanai, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Nansmu, Monacan, Potawomac, Nataway, past, present, and future, and to the Piscataway tribes who have lived on both sides of the river from time immemorial. I invite you to acknowledge the indigenous stewards of the land wherever you are zooming in from and to write their names in the chat. Today's guest artists, Julia Cho and Che Yu, have each had remarkable careers and the biographies I'm going to share are abridged at best. Uh, Julia Cho is a playwright, television writer, and screenwriter. Her plays include Office Hour, Aubergine, The Language Archive, Durango, BFE, The Architecture of Loss, and 99 Histories. Her work has been produced at the Vineyard Theater, the Public Theater, Long Wharf, Long Wharf Theater, Playwrights Horizons, South Coast Repertory, New York Theater Workshop, East West Players, the Theater at Boston Court, Theater Moo, and Silk Road Theater Project, among others. Her honors include the 2020 Wyndham Campbell Literary Prize and the 2010 Susan Smith Blackburn Award, the 2005 Barry Stavis Award, the 2005 Claire Toll Award for Emerging Artist, and the 2004 L. Arnold Weisberger Award. An alumna of the Juilliard School and NYU's dramatic writing program, Julia was also a resident playwright at New Dramatist. Our next guest is one of America's premier directors and the short list of his production credits include the Public Theater, Playwrights Horizons, New York Theater Workshop, Signature Theater, Ensemble Studio Theater, Mark Taper Forum, Goodman Theater, American Conservatory Theater, Denver Theater Center, Huntington Theater, Oregon Shakespeare Theater, La Jolla Playhouse, Woolly Mam, Seattle Rep, Berkeley Rep, Cincinnati Playhouse, Humanifest, Kennedy Center, Cornerstone Theater, Roundhouse Theater, Victory Gardens, Playmakers Rep, Curious Theater, North Light, Empty Space, Pillsbury House Theater, Gala Hispanic Theater, and Singapore Repertory Theater, amongst others. He is a recipient of the Obie Award for Direction. Also a playwright and alumna of New Dramatist, an affiliate of the Playwrights Center in Minneapolis, and he was the artistic director of Victory Gardens Theater in Chicago from 2011 to 2020. For his leadership there, he was awarded the Iris Award for outstanding commitment to connecting Chicago communities and the arts, and the Impact Award for bold and inclusive artistic leadership. Please join me in welcoming Julia Cho, I'm sorry, Julia Cho and Che Yu. I'm very excited to have you all here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jola. That was such a nice intro. <laughs> Nice to be here. It's great. It's an honor to speak to you both. I'm a huge fan of your work, as I shared last week, Julia, for multiple reasons. A uh, huge fan of you both, not the least of which is the way you consistently push the boundaries of our understanding of the human experience, often through the lens of culture and race. So I like to start with this question. It's, it's no secret that my first foray into theater involved writing and performing stories inspired by autobiography. But I think all artists bring their own culture, identities, histories, and histories into, into their work. 
So I'm always interested in how life experience informs creative practice. I'm wondering if each of you would tell us a little about the communities you've inhabited and how they've informed the stories you tell. I'll start with you, Julia. Um, it's such a big question. Uh, I, I think that, you know, I always thought of writing as kind of um, like a stone in water. And so for me, when I first began, um, the first ripple was very close to me, right? Me being the stone. So I felt like, what was my first play? And Che knows my first play very well because he workshopped it and developed it and was um, a huge part of that process. Um, it was about a young Korean American woman. What a surprise, <laughs> you know? And I did, definitely gussied it up with many non autobiographical moments. But, um, but yeah, I definitely felt safest in this territory of having somebody who is similar to me. Um, and then I think after that, the ripples grew wider. So it was almost like then I could write about um, different people, different communities. Um, I, I eventually wrote, um, I started After 99 Histories being part of a theater community um, that was very diverse. And um, I had a, a fellowship at New York Theater Workshop that was all playwrights of color. And we would get together and workshop our plays and work together, not just with other, um, it wasn't just like playwrights of color, it was also like directors of color, actors of color. And I started to be part of this amazing community and wanting to write parts for the amazing actors I was exposed to and working with. And so then eventually I just started to write plays that incorporated many different ethnicities or races. And, um, and eventually I tried to write a play language archive that didn't really specify any race or ethnicity. Um, and then I boomeranged right back after that um, to writing about my own ethnicity but in a very different way so it was almost like the ripples went out and then another stone came crashing in which was probably my i don't know midlife crisis or something and suddenly i was right back to writing close to the bone um but in a very different way and um so it's just been a process of um both writing sort of specifically from my own experience trying to write not from my own experience yes. and then returning yet again to my own experience in any way that's a great trajectory, inspiring, yes. What about you, Che? Um, I think whatever I do, there's always a, gonna be a huge part of who I am, at least the essence of it, yeah. which is in either the work that I direct or definitely the work that I create as a playwright as well. Um, so I would say the communities immediately would be, of course, Asian American, mm -hmm. Chinese, um, then rippling out to the LGBTQ plus community, and definitely being an immigrant to this country, immigrant narratives are very close to my soul because I always feel that this is an issue that has always been the foundation of our country, but yet it's always brittle. Every day it's fraught with people coming in and being part of this fabric called the United States. So these communities are the ones that I feel very close to. And I think um, once I became an artistic director, I understood my communities to be physical where the theater was. So if the theater was in Chicago, all communities became important to me of how to represent them, how to give them more voice and visibility on our stages. So to some extent, um, I think being a director has given me more of a passport than being a playwright has, because being a playwright, I would have to write usually around who I am and what my skin is, which I do love. Mm -hmm. And as a director, I begin to learn more about my citizenship as an American and also as, as a global citizen, what it means to live with each other and what justices need to be fought for to create a more equitable society. So that part of understanding plays, immersing myself in different worlds has given me a lot of not only joy, but fodder to become a better person. Yeah, that's great too. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, like many institutions everywhere, George Mason University uh, is in the throes of bolstering diversity, equity, and inclusion across the board. Um, and this guest artist series actually is an outgrowth of a graduate course, Dramatic Theory and Criticism, Unpacking Race and Power in Contemporary American Theater. The curriculum of that course represents a deliberate departure from the traditional approach to dramatic theater, theory, which centers 
European scholars, uh, discourse modes of making. My goals are manifold and ambitious, uh, but include developing more awareness of the ways in which the underrepresentation of marginalized voices persists in the American theater, becoming more familiar with artists and scholars of color engaged in conversations for radical change and racial justice, cultivating more comfort and proficiency when discussing race, power, and privilege, and ultimately identifying and then articulating how race informs our own aesthetics, processes, and practices as theater makers. Um, over the course of the semester, we've looked at a number of plays, a number of different ways of grappling with race and power. Most recently, we read Durango um, by one of my favorite playwrights here, Julie Cho. And the cover of the Dramatist Playlist publication reads, to the outside world, the Lee boys look perfect. Isaac is on track to be a doctor and his younger brother, Jimmy, a champion swimmer. But when their widowed father, Wu Sing, decides to take them on a road trip to Durango, Colorado, the carefully constructed facades of all three begin to crack. As they near that, <laughs> tempers flare, old wounds reopen, and secrets are revealed. Durango is the story of a man who sacrificed everything, a home, a country for the American dream, and whose sons must now grapple with the consequences of that choice. So as it turns out, the two of you collaborated on one of the first, if not the first productions of this play at the Public Theater. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that experience and that collaborative process. Um, either of you are welcome to. I'll jump in to say how, um, you know, it's, it's hard to describe the impact Che has had on my life, <laughs> but even as it- him, Yeah, and you list him as one of your mentors. And yeah, one. for sure, for sure. Um, oh, great, I'm Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yes, you yeah. are, you are my, you are my guru. Um, <laughs> you know, so even with Durango, even though it was an early play of mine, by that time, Che and I had already worked with each other quite a bit. And so we did a lot of development of that play together. Um, at the time, Che, I think you were still director of the Asian American Writers Workshop at the Chaper, mm -hmm. um, which was an incredible incubator for uh, Asian American writers. I, I mourn that it's gone. It's, it was such an amazing place. Um, but uh, what we did was we workshop Durango at uh, the uh, at the O'Neill. So we did at the O'Neill Playwrights Conference, and we did an extended workshop there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we did, wasn't it a co-production? We did it at Long Wharf and then it moved to the public. So we were together on that play for a very long time. Very long time. Yeah. Also um, East Coast players, Julia. At East Coast players. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So there was a lot going on with that play. Um, and I will say, um, you know, the thing about Che was that he really taught me how to think about, um, not just not just the play itself, but but was always so um, pressing me. Like, what what is this? What do you want it to be? What do you want it to say? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I can't even remember specific conversations because it felt like we were just in one long conversation for such a long time. But I do remember um, feeling like such an ease because we understood we both understood it from this very Asian American perspective. Um, yeah. I will say a caveat, which is um, Che will be moss about this, but what what is I think really extraordinary about him is I have seen him direct and um, mentor uh, players of all backgrounds. Like it is not the case that um, he uh, focuses solely on nurturing. I think the next generation of Asian American uh, talent. Like what I have seen is he has nurtured an entire generation of like players of color of all different backgrounds, um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and so I think in general, he's just extraordinary at it. Um, but then for us, there was, I think, an added um, just resonance because we we delighted in the fact that we were able to tell this Asian American story and pull in like Linda Cho, an Asian American costume designer who could get the apron that Jimmy wears just right. Like, you know, there's so many like little details that we were able to bring to in, in, to mining our own experience that made it 
beyond just a satisfying work experience or theatrical experience, it made it just a profoundly satisfying personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt the whole play was so nurtured and taken care of the entire way, which isn't, you know, you hope for that ideal, but it isn't always the case. Um, and it really spoiled me, I think, for the future in terms of <laughs> what I expected from my collaborators. Um, and then I will also say the other amazing thing about Che's um, mentoredness is that he always spoke to me like an equal, even before I really was his equal, frankly. You know, he never, um, he, he always just, just looked at the work with such respect and reverence and really made that experience um, just indelible in every way. So um, I always want to thank, I, I, keep, I, I feel like there's so much to thank him for, but this is a, a nice way to, to thank him publicly and embarrass him. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was a very unusually um, smooth process. Um, you know, but I will say, and, and I'll, I'll, I don't want to talk forever because I want to hear your side of it too, but you know, <laughs> I, I do think that there is a sense of audience that is that at least back then, because this is like, this was quite a while ago that we were doing Durango. And, you know, it, it did sort of feel like as much as we enjoyed the process, there was always a question of, you know, how to reach an Asian American audience, you know, with the play and knowing that a lot of the times for previews and performances, um, we had an audience that didn't share our background. So it was it was kind of interesting to be in that space, to be both in a space that felt profoundly Asian American when we were in process of rehearsing it and developing it, but then always being aware that um, the ultimate arbiters would not be Asian American, right? That, that ultimately it would be before an audience and critics and a community, um, some of whom may get it and some of whom may not. So I think there was always a little bit, at least on our part or my part, I should say, a little bit of um, measured expectations, you know, that, that I didn't know quite what the world would make of it. So maybe in a way that made me uh, appreciate and enjoy the process that much more. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's wonderful, Julia. There's so much in there that I want to dive into, but I won't. <laughs> so that Joe, can, so that Che can uh, uh, share with us his experience. Um, working with Julia is basically a shorthand in a in a wonderful way. I think sometimes you find collaborators. Yeah. Uh, whom you can actually have a beautiful shorthand. And that's usually sometimes the emotional quality of the work and also to some extent the world in which the artist, the artist creates. And Julia actually writes painfully beautiful plays which are very truthful. And yet it's also partly wonderful because it's in subtext. So what is not written is actually breathing between the lines. And in Durango, she beautifully captured the complete complexities between fathers and children, particularly in a Korean American experience. But I think that permeates into any Asian American culture and permeates into any culture where there are fathers and sons. And I think that portrait is the one that we bring home and also the one that we experience immediately viscerally when we see and experience the play. It, of course, it brings up a lot of issues, particularly unresolved issues that we always have with our parents, particularly with our fathers. And I think in this particular play too, what is remarkable too, it's Julia's version of the American dream that we rarely hear about, that silent, invisible, um, person that you see in the office who's there hacking away for decades only to be let go. And by sacrificing everything for the children, only to have them as strangers in their own household. Yeah. So to some extent, um, this portrait, I wish there were more of these portraits. I mean, looking at the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes at the moment is because there are so few of these stories that make us visible and actually um, vocal. So right. you really had done a remarkable job bringing to life these stories in the 90s. And of course, since had written more. I'm just only saying as an artist in this community that we need more of our stories. For the American fabric to be truly an American fabric, we need all kinds of stories because this is where we come from. That's where we're going to be headed towards. And Julia too is poetical as much as she may hate that word. There is a turn of a word, there is a phrase that lingers in the air and you don't need a lot of lines. It's just the right word and it's economical, it's precise and it's deadly. 
And I think she shies away from um, the mundane, which is very interesting. But yet through the mundane, she finds uniqueness within the characters and their relationships. I would say that Durango is a slice of life. I don't think there's anything earth shattering about what the characters are doing, but in the way that it's portrayed, the way it's written, the way that it's told is truly unique and a work of art, a master of art actually. I, that's one of the few plays that I still hold on to very deeply because I feel that at the end of the play is devastating where there's no more words left to describe a relationship. And where do they go from here? There are no easy solutions. And in that wonderful way, Julia has captured a very brutal portrait of a family, an immigrant family in a way, in a way where the children are American and yeah. father is Asian and the divide is never to be bridged. Yeah. Yeah, you articulated my own feeling very well that there's a beautiful economy and, and poetry in the language. Um, and it, it, um, it just feels, it feels very complete. And uh, I know one reviewer said uh, one of the most palpable things about the play is, is absence, <laughs> right? But the absence okay. has a presence. The silence has a presence. And shout out to you too, Che. Yes, you are a mentor for many of us. Yes, hello. Happy to. I also say that, you know, this trope that Julie has written is the road trip. Yes. Trope, which is a very American um, trope because right. we have seen it on films and now we're seeing it in movies and theaters and uh, as well as TV. But what is remarkable that it is an Asian American story about going to a place where they never reach. They never reach, they never reach it, like the American dream for so many, right? That's right. Um, and so it, it strikes me too that not a word on the back cover of the play identifies the characters as Korean or Korean American. Um, and, you know, I mean, we could take the exclusion in many directions yeah. uh, because it, it is an American story, but I wonder if either of you have any thoughts about the description that's on the back of the book. Uh, yeah, it's funny because I think I might have written it, but I don't really recall anymore. <laughs> but, but as I was, yeah, but as I was listening to you read it, I was thinking like, oh yeah, I, I think there's this thing where it's coded. You know what I mean? It's not blatantly saying Korean American, but if you know Korean or, or Asian American, and no, you would know Busang is probably a Korean name. You would yeah. think Lee and I, like, like I was thinking about like how in a way the description, I, whether consciously or not, I think was written to, to um, be a little bit of, yeah, of a code. It's like, if you are yeah. Asian American, you will understand this is Asian American, oh, especially, definitely. yeah, and especially the evocation of the American dream makes it clearly like this is an immigrant story without saying it's an immigrant story. So I think what's kind of funny about that description is that if you're not aware of the code, the, the description would still work. You would still understand what the play is about. But then if you do, the description works on a different level. And that actually is as, for the play as a whole, I imagine, is maybe how it works as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's yeah. true. Yeah. It back to what you said about how do you, how do you bring an audience into this story, mm -hmm. invite them in to a space for, uh, to, where a narrative is, uh, is specifically Asian American, but it also resonates in so many different ways for other people who don't share yeah. cultural uh, uh, heritage, right? Yeah, and, and I think that really is a tool that artists of color develop and hone really, really well. But it's And it's a, a tool that I think non-artists of color don't need to ever even pick up. I mean, it's such a funny, it's such a funny thing to, to think of how we move through the world differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, Beautiful. How, how would you define the American canon of dramatic literature um, and how does your work relate to it, Julia? Oh gosh, you know, there's definitely when I think of a, a classic American canon of plays that I actually love. I love Long Day's Journey into Night. I love Tennessee Williams, um, mm -hmm. Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. I mean, these are just extraordinary plays, um, which I think of as the classic American plays. Um, and then there's actually a canon of classic Asian American plays, right? Like that, um, 
that I'm versed in, right? Like, you know, and the social dance or just like all of these like earlier in the 80s, even T, you know, of Lena So Houston, I'm probably saying your name wrong, but there's like a whole generation of plays in the 80s and 90s that I feel like if you are taking like an Asian American literature of course, you would <laughs> read these plays. And I think that's similarly too for, you know, African American, like there's like, um, there's a whole like Latinx or like Hispanic American or whatever you want to call, you know, like I, I think every group kind of has our canon that they construct. And I think what is complicated is the ways in which all these separate canons, I don't think we've ever figured out a way to fully integrate them into one large canon of American, you know, uh, dramatic literature. Um, and so for me, I feel like, I, I don't know, I don't know quite yet how I feel about the canon. I feel like um, a profound connection to to the American plays I love. I feel gratitude for the educational institutions that perpetuate an Asian American canon so that I can still get read. Um, but I, I don't know, I guess I'm less concerned about entering into the canon these days. Um, this is not quite related, but it is a little related in the sense that um, I find that I get less frustrated at the resources poured into um, classic American texts, and I get more frustrated maybe at the at the way in which the same plays get produced and reproduced. You know, so I, I you know, Shakespeare's great, but I, I just I sometimes get so tired of like how many resources get poured into redoing, you yeah. know, yeah. the same classics, even from different perspectives. And so, I think for me, it's it's less about the canon as a prestigious thing, but how do we balance canonical work with new work so that we're not mm -hmm. kind of cutting off ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that might be something, Che, you thought about too in being the artistic director of a theater, right? Because I do think that artistic directors of theaters have to sort of balance that just on a pragmatic level of like tried and true, people are gonna come in to see this and also, you know, the carrot and stick of like, <laughs> you know, seeing new work that challenges them and stuff. So I, I'd love to hear it from that perspective, you know, the producerial perspective. As would I, Che. <laughs> Look, the canon is always in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> so if you say to yourself, this is the canon, you yeah. make it. Yeah. So as a producer, as an academic, as an artist, as a citizen, you have to figure out what that really means. Yeah. And I think to some extent, the canon can always expand and it can always be more elastic. And I think when you're in the 21st century and say, what is the American canon? If you only see plays by straight and white men, it's going to be a problem. And I think we're more interesting than that as a nation and as a field. So to some extent, as an artistic director, I always feel that if I, as a nonprofit organization, I get my money from the government and the money also comes from taxpayers. So that means I represent all the taxpayers and also who is really in my physical community that I need to represent because we are a theater. So if you only represent, well, let's say 50% of your audience all the time, you should return all your money back to the government and declare yourself for-profit theater and please don't bore us anymore. Right. I think to some extent what we need to become as an American theater is what, how do you define American? And I think right now, right you know, this cultural war, which is very complicated, yeah. everybody is de defining it their own way. But to me, I think we are a more interesting nation than that because you look at every corner of the city and the street. If you sit on a bus, on a train, this is your country. So how do we tell these stories? So black stories actually belong to all Americans, as well as Asian stories and histories and Latinx, even white stories. I think we are more interesting than that. That's all I'm saying. And by cutting off your legs and saying, this is the only one way of looking at it, I think we have to challenge that. And I'm sure students are doing that, artists are doing that. And as I've always said to other people too, if you, they do not want you at the table, leave. Build your own, invite your people. Yeah. Because that table is not going to be full for long. Yeah. All I can say is um, that right there. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm on my own personal mission to expand what we think of as the American canon, right? But I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I do think it's, it is possible. I think a lot of people are fearful because mm -hmm. one is, well, we're going to lose an audience. Well, when I came into my theater, I remember losing 50% of my subscribers with a hip hop show, but I gained 
the 50% of my subscribers who loved the work that we were doing and we built. And within the three or four years, we had the youngest and most diverse audiences in the city. And this is Chicago. You're talking about Victory, Victory Gardens, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I believe it is possible. It's about vision, what you feel that you need to do. Yeah. And I think when you start towing the line, then you're always going to do Shakespeare. You, and I think I love Shakespeare too, but how about other stories that represent who we are as Americans living in this country today? I think there's a lot more room for that. Yeah. And right. I think this great pause that we have all endured and had gone through allows us a possibility of a great restart. And if we don't take this disruption that most of us have been praying for to rebuild, to reconstruct a better society for all of us involved, we have wasted 18 months. Right, right. Yeah, so, I, sorry, Julia, go ahead. No, I was just gonna chime in where I totally agree with that. And I and I sort of feel like Che was a radical even before the pandemic. I feel like he's been saying so many of these things oh, yeah. like ever since I started working with him. And and just to sort of underline that to me, what really stands out is a sense that theater is ours. You know, I, there's a sense that there are gatekeepers that we don't belong there, that they won't let us in. And I think this idea that it's ours to create, ours to uh, that it actually always was. There was just a, it was just an illusion that we couldn't access it. Um, because we always had the power to make our own, tell our own stories, create our own spaces. Um, so I think that, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to sort of underscore how I think important that is. Um, I think that the problem with American theater is that we don't actually have a codified manifesto for American theater, which is kind of one of our strengths because it's almost like we can, it's a very fluid thing. Um, I just had a couple of years ago, I was in Korea for a, a translated production of Aubergine, which is fascinating, but they have a national theater there mm -hmm. and they had their manifesto etched into a wall for what their wow. national theater was. And I wish I had taken a picture of it, but I, I remember being so struck by it because one of the things it sort of said was this idea that this is theater for the people. It's by the people, it should be for the people. Yes. And their ticket prices were like $25, I think. Wonderful. And everyone in their audience was under the age of 30. I, th I felt like I was the oldest person in the audience. Um, and it was like cool, it was like a cool thing to go to theater. It was like something that like the young people did, it was amazing. That's but cool. I guess, it just made me think like, oh, we don't have a national theater and Britain does have a national theater and you can see how the impact having a national theater can do, you know, I think on uh, theater as a whole. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I feel like we can kind of embrace that we don't have a national theater because it's motlier and more uh, multi, multi voiced. Um, but I do think it's worth it to really think like, well, what is my personal manifesto and how do I, how do I like do this theater making with intention and Right. Um, you know, what kind of impact do I want to have? Uh, and so that's sort of just something I think. And there, there is something to be yeah. said to, to your point also for national endorsement and legitimacy and obviously funding. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Because the government funding that Chain mentioned, I mean, right. if there was actually a national theater, then that right. the funding would, I mean, what, what it is now is so little, which is why I think theaters are always operating in the, in the red. Um, but to have a truly funded and supported national theater. Yeah. And, and we sort of have the privilege of imagining that the access <laughs> to those resources, right, would uh, be open to everyone who is creating mm -hmm. theater, telling stories, diverse stories. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Uh, che, you just finished directing uh, Sweatshop Over Overlord <laughs> by the talented Christina Wong at New York Theater Workshop. And in a recent Facebook post, you said, uh, with Christina's unique voice and her penchant for political satire and critique, this particular work has also given me the opportunity to give more voice to the Asian American community, especially in a time where we are targets of hate crimes. Sweatshop also provides a space for New Yorkers to come together as a city to process our past 18 months of isolation and trauma through Christina's wicked and pointed humor. Could you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, um, I have a little reputation in American theater for being the director to go to when there is no script and we're announcing the season with your name on it. <laughs> so Christina was actually, uh, I've known her since actually Asian Theater Workshop which Julie mentioned and she was younger. We brought her in and she was doing a little uh, performance piece and I loved her voice. 
She's a remarkable satirist. And during the pandemic, she was freaking out because she was, all her income was gone and we were all deemed unessential. So what she did was she's trying to figure out what her call to arms was going to be. And she realized that she could actually sew masks for people. And as a result of that, the supply uh, was not meeting the demand of masks. And what she did through, the, through Facebook and the internet was to create the anti-sewing squad, which is all about people sewing masks in all 30 states. And I think they probably supplied about 250,000 masks, if not more. And during this time of isolation, she created a community of people. And in this particular work, she also talks about anti-Asian violence yeah. and particularly about masking. There's one moment in the piece where she says, I really don't want to wear a mask in the early days because this mask I'm wearing is the one that they're telling me that to go home, that I brought this disease here, right. this, this pandemic. So she articulated a lot of fresh wounds to all of us in the community because we had no way of actually responding to this. So this piece was born out of the pandemic and actually documents it completely. So during this process, I didn't anticipate the gift that was the ability to process all that we have gone through for the last 18 months, politically, personally, and socially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also more importantly, to just give light to what Americans have, Asian Americans have gone through yeah. during this pandemic. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I just have one more question and then I'm going to open it up for questions and answers. Um, I'll bounce this back to Julia first. Julia, who is creating theater that inspires you, past or present, and why? Uh, Che Yu. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. Yeah. Everything he just described about Christina Wong's project makes me want to uh, see it immediately. Um, yeah. I, I think uh, right now the work, I, I mean, gosh, right now I feel like the work that is inspiring to me is work that is addressing the pandemic and is like, kind of processing this immense crazy experience that we have all been through and are continuing to go through because it's not over yet. Um, to me, the tackling of this, um, the, the difficulty of um, all of the Asian hate crimes um, and also this new wave of just how the ground has shifted. The fact that we introduce ourselves by saying things like, I'm coming from the unceded land of the Lomi people, you know, which is where Berkeley is. That's extraordinary, you know, and even all like where I live, like so many Black Lives Matter posters springing up. Um, at first I was cynical. I was like, oh, these liberals are just pretending, but I'm like, the signs are still there, you know, and yeah. and just thinking of the shift that has happened. Um, so I think for me, anything right, particularly right now, like the artists who are really like trying to grapple with like documenting this shift and processing it, I think it's really inspiring. Um, previously, before the pandemic, I had actually been really inspired by the, the I feel like the extraordinary um, burst of talent, like in the new African American, the new Black playwrights, like unbelievable. I, I was so envious. I was like, I wish, I wish Asian Americans were doing work so cool. Like there was just so much happening, like so many intelligent new voices that were coming. I mean, and are still there, but, you know, but just like watching a fair view or like watching people really interrogating things in new ways is really exciting and um and i think that's of course still continuing but yeah i just i just find like um you know there's just so much new and interesting work happening i think um and i what i'm also excited is to see a bit like what new media will do as people like start mm -hmm. to kind of grapple with um is streaming going to be somehow part of the future how does theater survive in a digital age like there's so many exciting questions that are happening so um, looking yeah. forward, I'm super excited. Uh, I feel like a dinosaur now, but in a good way. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes new people, new good. smarter people are, are tackling these questions. Yeah, thank you, Julia. What about you, Che? It's kind of the same. I mean, the first and foremost thing is, I think uh, all my collaborators I've worked with has always been inspiring to me because particularly playwrights, you know, Julia, Marcus Gardley, um, Luis Alfaro. Yeah. I think these are the plays that I would never be able to write. But the fact that I could actually be a part of the process in terms of giving it, breathing life into these plays is actually not only an honor, but also a great learning 
experience for me. And I would say the people who inspire me consistently are the next generation of theater artists and leaders. Mm -hmm. Just listening to the way they think differently, uh, the challenges that they set up for themselves, and the walls they want to tear down with new work has always been very inspirational to me. So in a full circle sort of way, where Julia said, you know, I'm always like running around being Yoda to a lot of folks. The other thing is that they are my Yodas too. I'm learning so much about the way that they see and potential new ways of creating work. So I'm always inspired by the young people because I feel like they have a lot to show us and to gift us. Thank you. That's great. Um, I, we're at that part in the afternoon when I'll invite folks to uh, ask you questions. You can go back to gallery view if you're not there already. And if you raise a virtual hand or real hand, I'll try to recognize you and get your, uh, get your voice on the floor. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, Rex, you've got the floor. Thank you. Hi, Julian and Che. So great to talk with you both. Um, I just had a question for you both about new work, particularly um, particularly working together um, on new work. And <clears throat> excuse me, what's important to you both about the vision that a director brings to the dramaturgy and writing phase? Uh, of uh, of a piece of new work, I'm 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 interested in that as a primarily as a director and artistic director, but I'm interested to hear both angles of for, from you, Che, of what's important to you about bringing vision and um, uh, you know new ideas to a piece, but also Julia, from you, what's important about that working relationship and how do you you know uh, spawn new ideas and and, and reflect and, and use it, that relationship for creation of new work? Um, I will go first. As a director of new work, your only priority is the playwright and the play they have written because it's the first outing. So that's why I always ask Julia, what do you intend? How did you see this? And my work is to actually amplify and create hopefully a more of a playing field for the playwright and the actors to work it within. Um, I am also very different because as a playwright, I would also say this is not what you should do as directors. I think my relationship with playwrights is a little different because I'm able to talk to them in a, in a playwright voice, I guess. So I could be very prescriptive about certain things and I would just say, how about this? How about that? And we actually have a great brainstorming session. But in the end, the play is the thing and all of us are there to serve to tell the story. So to some extent, um, my big... Uh, caveat is, if I have not given the playwright the play that they have written on opening night, I have failed because we're interpretive artists. Now, you can put a spin on anything that you want to in a classic play because we've, we've seen that play. You know, we can do the Scottish play in a roller skating rink playing Olivia Newton-John. Great. If that works, that's your vision. You are the quote unquote author of this production. But in a new play, remember, the playwright's name is above the director's name. So we have to honor the playwright and her play. Right. Yeah, and I guess the way I would sort of, you know, it's interesting because like, you know, so Che was sort of alluding to how he gets sort of called upon when there is no play yet, you know, or there's only like part of a play. So I think there is one part, one version of the collaboration between a playwright and a director where the, the, like it's it's almost like a midwife like you're still sort of like helping pull the baby out you know it's like not fully birthed yet and Che is sort of a master of that because he's egoless right like what you just heard is somebody who's like I have no ego in this process it's about the play and the playwright um and so I think the the other version is when there is a play right like you know and I tend to be more like that like I I get really scared showing anyone anything until it's done so I I, I almost feel like I have to have something fairly concrete before I let people read it um, and so then in the collaboration that Kay and I have done, um, and, and that's another version, right, where it'll be a director who gets more like a fully formed play. Um, and I think that in that version, what's best is if both of the people are egoless, you know, in a way. I mean, Che talks about serving the playwright, which is great. And I think they're, you know, I guess over time I have felt like even I, the playwright, am also in service to the play. 
And I think the ideal collaboration is when the both the playwright and the director sort of feel like, because like I as a playwright, I can write stinkers for sure. I've written many plays that do not work. So when I write a play that does work, there's something almost like, I don't know why it works. Let's just protect that. Let's just protect the fact that it actually works, you know, and that I myself may be writing from some unconscious place that I'm not fully in control of. So then I think that there's also a version of the process where both the director and the playwright are in service to the play in a weird way, like as this, we, we, we got this gift of a thing and how do we both make sure it, it wants to be in the world? How do we help it be in the world in the best possible way? Uh, and then I think that is kind of a great place to be because you're, you truly are collaborators. He's not serving me. I'm not serving him. We're serving the play. Can I ask a follow up on that of like, how do you agree on what the, like, are there effective ways that you found on how you agree what the play is when you're, when you're both sort of at, uh, different angles on pushing that baby out <laughs> to use your metaphor, Julia. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, like, how do you find, how do you agree? Like we both think the play is this, how do we, go in that direction. Um, what do you mean? Um, I guess like, uh, like for me a practice I would do is like, we would, between me and a writer, we would come up with a compass um, of like, we, we both agree that this piece is about, you know, this quality or wants to accomplish this with the audience. And then we, and then my notes as a director is serving towards the compass that's agreed on um, as a way of, as a way of taking ego out of it, of like, as opposed to, I think it should be this, is like, we've agreed that the project, you know, um, are these elements. Um, so I'm just curious, like, are there other ways that you find yourself working towards the play, um, serving the play, that it kind of seems like it's separate from both of you? Can I, can I jump in here? Because I just want to, you know, my interpretation of what I hear Che and Julia saying is that you're both doing careful listening. Julia, you're listening to the characters who come forward, right, to tell their stories and in creating the arc of that story. And Shay, you're, is, you're listening to Julia in this case or other playwrights or, and, I, and I'm sure at some point you develop your own relationship with the characters and the narrative, right? And somehow you have to develop a language to talk about those things. Um, I, I don't know if that process necessarily is one that you superimpose the producer's sort of mission on. <laughs> I don't know. We don't, yeah, we don't discuss what the producers, process. we don't really discuss what the producers want exactly, <laughs> until, like, exactly. until previews perhaps. Exactly. No, I, you know, I think Rex, to go back to your question and then sort of going into what Joel is saying too, that like, it's like a multi-layered conversation. So I don't actually think initially Che and I would have very blunt conversations about this, the play is about X or, you know, it's more just about like, you know, Che was saying like, it's just interrogating like, well, where did it come from? And what, you know, it's, it's almost more like a, a more like softer asking around the play. And I think a lot of it is coming at it from a place of openness of not necessarily knowing what the play is about. So it's not like Che is saying, what's the play about? Like, it's about X. And, and then we hew to that. It's more just like, I think it might be X. And he's like, well, let's see. <laughs> you know? And then, and if it is, then, you know, and then, and then you start to fold in the practicalities of like, you start to discover what the, what you both think, because not because you're in a room together, just talking, but you're both looking at a set design, right? Your set designers come up with this concept and, and you might find out a lot by me saying, I like, a and Che being like, oh, that's really interesting because I thought you would like C, you know, but I'm like, yeah, but A is not literal. It's really abstract. And then like, oh, so you think of this as more abstract. Like, so you start to discover in the process of having these very like pragmatic discussions about how literal are the costumes? Like, and who are the actors? Like, what qualities do you, like, who's Bu Sang? Like that would come out because of who we wanted to cast as Bu Sang, right? It'd be like, you know, that would make it really clear, like who the character is in our discussions about who to cast and why. So you start to like, it's like archeology, span right? You start to over time and over multiple conversations, it starts to become clear and clear, like, and hopefully you guys are on the same page and are discovering more and more how much you have in common as opposed to, oh no, we don't see this thing in the same at all, you know? Um, and, and, then, and then to your point, I think once again to like previews and rehearsals, 
you're like, this song is supposed to make people feel moved, not make them laugh. And they're like, oh, well, then we better do it differently so that we make people feel what you want them. Yeah. So, so then I think there's a space for that kind of like, like fine tuning of like, I want this scene to have this effect. Oh yes, me too. And let's, how do we do that? Maybe we change the way the the blocking is or the lights or who, you know. So it's just a really like very uh, long and intricate conversation, you know. And each play is very different too, right? Because I think uh, the most important thing I think I can give to you is listen to the play. It will always surprise you because when you keep doing it differently, different ways, the, the sense of play is happening. Look, the player has lived with the play for at least a year, if not more. For some of us, it's the first week. And sometimes I may have staged the whole play in my head. I know all the lines. And when I go into staging, you go with instincts and everyone else, and it changes very differently from what you thought it's going to be. And that's the joy of creating a work, I think. So active listening, keep the sense of play. Um, Sometimes you will discover things that you never thought was actually there till the third week or during tech or previews. Mm -hmm. And definitely to what Julie has said, when you start bringing an audience in, you're going to learn more about the play. It's very, it's very hard, I have to say, because you're going to be in a profession and a calling where you don't know the answers. It's not about knowing the answers. It's about following the question. Yeah. That. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, bro. Uh, other questions? And feel free to put them in the chat as well. I'll try to respond to them if you don't feel like raising your hand. Um, well, if no one's going to jump in there, I will. Yes, um, Onawumi. I, I, I. This has been such a wonderful presentation for me. Um, I, for those of you who, uh, well, you don't know me, but Jola is the director of the first p play I've ever written. And the title of the play was Seriously, is Seriously, What Did You Call Me? It has to do with my name, not the name that I've been called is not even on my birth certificate. I was born in the uh, Jim Crow South. But the way we got to this, Jola said, give me a timeline. I gave him a timeline, but I, I moved quickly through that period of time when I was married. Jola looked at the timeline and said, what is this? What was happening here? And when I said it was when, during the period I was married and had three children, Jola said, this is where we will start. And when he did it, he scared me to death because that was one of the most dark periods of my life. And I had had three children. How do you tell that? Jola, Jola, I cannot talk about that without feeling emotional, but I will tell you that the play in the short time that we had to write it, and it was a very brief time, the play has been a success because of its relatability, because of its relevance, because of something you said, Che, about your audience comes from everywhere. They have had all kinds of experiences and that you don't have to structure anything so tightly that any of those experiences have to be left out, nor do you have to pan, uh, what do you call it, pander to your audience, so that one experience dominates another. When you talked about canon, I want to hear more about canon, because it is not the canon in these United States with people from all over the planet in this particular country. It is a matter of there being canons and having the courage to create your own. I thank you so much, both of you, and to Jola, I'm forever, I'm forever in, in, in love with him for his 
And Joel is, Joel is no pushover as a director. Here is my interpretation of Joel. Uh-oh. <laughs> Here it is. On a woman. What are you doing? <laughs> what, where did that come from? <laughs> and I'd have to stop on a woman. You've just left your husband. And you act as though you're going out to get groceries. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized in that moment, I realized in that moment that I had hidden all of that emotion and did not know that it was closeted in me. Yeah. Yeah. And when I spoke it, when I looked at it and I began to understand what it was that I had repressed. Something came alive in me and in the play. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that so much, Honolulu. Wow. You know, and I was just going to say that that does sort of remind I think Jola, you and Che went to the same school of directing. I feel like very <laughs> well. You know, and, and just to say really briefly that I think creating is such a, if you're doing it right, I think it's a profoundly terrifying experience. Yes. It's very scary, you know, yes. to write a play, to write, to direct, it, to it any is. of these, to it act. Is. I mean, think of the terror of acting yeah. and being exposed and vulnerable. So I would say that the number one thing that Che, it sounds like Jola, you also mastered this, is you yeah. make your collaborator, your co-artist feel safe. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of listening. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah. I don't know who Che's uh, mentors were, but I had one of the best. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you brought anything into the room, she was going to use it. So, <laughs> so that was my that was my biggest lesson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I saw Caitlin. I see you, but I saw Deb's hand up earlier. I don't know if her question or comment was answered. Yeah, I was like trying to throw it into the chat. I was like, I don't know. I think, hi, thanks hi. so much for being here. Um, this is a question just uh, maybe on behalf of students, but something that I grappled with as a young Korean American artist in my early career. Um, how do you, can you speak to sort of the, the issues that like young, especially actors and designers of color sort of run into where, they want so much to speak to their lived experiences, especially when they're cast in roles that are like, say, specifically like an Asian role in an Asian play. Um, but then like they end up sort of getting stereotyped or used as sort of part of the narrative of said play. If there aren't other people in the room to speak out and take care, like I spent many years in my early career being the token person of color in a room. And so I know this is a question that many of our students have, of like how to be yourself, but not put yourself in danger of being exploited. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's a great question. Che, you want to take it or do you want me to jump um, in? Are you talking about uh, your collaborators feeling that way? To, uh, uh, or are you talking about the work itself, the play that you are performing? Oh, it's a little both. I think it's more about collaborators. Collaborators have great intentions on the way in, and then maybe on the way out, you're like, that was not the execution of those intentions. Sometimes they just need to be schooled. So you can speak your truth and tell them what you think. And if they can't take that shit, they should be collaborating with you anyway. God bless you. Yes. yes. I wish I had known this 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, and I, and I do think like um, writers are just a little bit of a different area just because like, I think what was the one nice thing about being writers, you could just sort of write what you want, whether or not anyone likes it. Okay. But as an actor, I mean, if you're sort of speaking to that side of it, it can be a little more difficult because you're not in control of a lot as an actor. You know, if you're in someone else's play or trying to get a part. Um, you know, I, I think to your point of like, how do you expose yourself and also kind of protect yourself? I mean, I, I think you, I, I think, I think a lot of the artists I know do have some kind of rituals, you know, for what they need to, to ground themselves. So, um, I mean, in terms of actors, I feel like literally there are rituals where actors will come off the stage and do something that marks that, that passage from being exposed to being, you know, themselves again. 
Um, and even as writers, I feel like a lot of writers have like grounding rituals that whether they call it a ritual or not, it could just be they call it a routine. Um, but I guess I was also thinking to your point that that the vulnerability, it, it's still worth it if you can if you can just keep it because it's it is the source of our strength too, to to tell our real stories, to be our real selves. You know, um, you can take it to Che's awesome warrior place of like telling people to their face <laughs> about their shit, which is amazing. Um, but I think also just the the consistency of like knowing your own truth and sticking to it, you know, and just being persistent and consistent. Um, because at the end of the day, it's for you. You're you're making the art for you and telling the stories you need to to tell. And no one can stop you, really, you know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think at some point, I think this is why a lot of the actors do move into creating their own work, you know, so perhaps that's more in, you know, your own, like performing one woman show, creating, like, you know, starting to expand beyond, um, whatever niche you're put in by creating your own work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's a you so much. question, and as we know, sometimes uh, Deb, it's a tightrope in academia, right? You're navigating a whole lot of things, a whole lot of voices, a whole lot of constraints, as well as opportunities. So, appreciate the question. Uh, to that moment, I just wanted to draw our attention to the chat for a second. Um, Dima has posted something. Dima Turkamani, one of our students at Mason, uh, that's kind of a follow-up, um, and they wrote. Uh, to add to that as a student, how do you find that trust, find the right collaborators and artists, especially if you are given a short timeline? Um, I will just basically say that, number one, um, playwrights should always have a conversation with a director before they are chosen. It's like a dating situation you will get to figure out whether you can speak, that they are listening to you, and whether they have a lot to show in the collaboration. Otherwise, find another husband. This is also true, true of your social life, so use that wisely. And I think if you can have conversations about the smallest things, you can have conversations about the biggest things. And the most important thing is you can communicate. Second thing is for actors, if you're a director, is also very easy, it's probably during auditions. You can tell when someone is not going to be a collaborator and someone who's actually a willing collaborator. These are the things that you will pick up as you keep doing it. And most importantly, create a family and a company. And I think if there is a way to also bring up what Deb has just articulated, create a room where everyone can contribute to telling the story and how they can be comfortable and also challenge. I'm not saying just because it has to be a safe space, we have to do always one specific thing. I'm just saying that we have to be collaborators, embracing the difficult as well as a place and an environment where we can be our true selves in exploring the work. Um, if you feel that you can't have that, that opportunity to do so, articulate it, speak it. If nothing is to be done, enjoy this date. And after this date, find another date but learn from this past experience that you can settle for nothing less than what you just have endured. Yeah, and everything Che just said, and also I think um, just, I don't know the context of the question, but it seems it's also about like, you guys are all in school and in programs and meeting a ton of people and sort of how do you find your tribe quickly? <laughs> um, and I will say school is probably an amazing place to find those people that you will be collaborating and friends with. So in my, uh, I, I guess my advice would be also to apply to residencies and fellowships where there are a lot of fellowships that are about making you part of a group of people, right? Like, so, um, like there are playwriting fellowships where you are part of a group of young playwrights and, and any of that, that sort of, uh, it, so it doesn't give you many money, but, but in the sense that like of doing as many things you can to find other people in your tribe, like trying those things. I would also say just, um, I, I feel like it's not really networking that I think is important so much as like when you do do work for your school, even if it's like the smallest thing and you think nobody will see it, totally be yourself in that piece. Because the thing is, they will find you, your, your tribe will find you, but only if you admit 
the flares. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And your work are those flares. Every time you share work in class, every time you ask a teacher to read your work, like it's not so much that you're trying to find people who love it because you're good, but it's like, are you trying to find people who resonate with it? And if you're not putting out work that is really you, they're not going to see the signal. So just putting out the work that is as much you as possible is the way people can find you. You're just kind of like throwing breadcrumbs out into the world. Um, and so I'll just say for Che and me, I, I don't know Che if you remember how we met, but I was a student at NYU in the graduate uh -oh. program. He came to talk as a guest. I don't know who invited you. Maybe it was Chiori. Um, and he spoke to the class and I'm normally quite shy and I, I don't know why, but I think I, I made myself talk to him and, and he didn't know me. I was just a kid in the class, right? And he gave me his card and said, I'm the director of the Asian American Writers Workshop, send me work. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and, I, and I did, you know, and, and because of that, oh, here we are. But I'm just saying like, um, in that case, there's two things that needed to happen. One, I needed to step up and be brave and like, say like, oh, this is a person who is part of, maybe we could be part of my path and try to connect with them. And then on the flip side of that, Che needed to be this extremely generous person. So I would say for everybody here, we're, we're all probably one of those two things, right? Like either you're the person who can make that, you know, be a little braver and make that connection, or you're the person who is connected and is and can be help and can help someone else, right? So I feel like, um, you, you know, that's another way to find your tribe. I'll say this too. Um, I assume that most of your students, the future is yours. Um, we have built a lot of things, even Joel and Julia, we did not start and create theater. It was handed to us. And on these shoulders, we stand. Now it's your turn. And I think as much as this country is very complicated these days and being divisive, there's one thing remarkable about this country that most countries do not possess is the freedom of speech. If you do not speak up, it's silence. And silence is a response. In other countries where you practice your art, speak the truth, you get to be put into jail or you get killed. So to some extent, what is the voice of your generation? If you don't speak the truth, you're given, a, I would say, a talent of telling, for telling stories. And the many people in your community that do not possess that talent, if you do not use that talent to tell those stories of your communities or your people, the community suffers. So to some extent, theater is one of the most beautiful ways where you don't have to do a lot to tell your story. You can do it in the garage of the 10 people. You can do a solo work where there's no fourth wall and you can speak your truth and tell everyone your experience. So to some extent, this is what you're coming out of from the pandemic and the world is yours. So seize that opportunity. And I all believe in this in my biggest of hearts because I am here today because of against all odds, being a gay immigrant foreigner, that I was able to run a theater. The fact is, you have to find your table. If you have to be the barbarian, the gate to go into some other place, that means you should say to yourself, it's not worth it because they're not really embracing you. When you own your table, then you can set the menu and the guest list. If you're invited to the table, remember, after the meal is done, you have to go. If you stay too long, they're going to make you clean. So the question to you is this. If no American theater wants you, start your own. Most of the famous American theaters that you know of started from the same place. Yeah. And most importantly is your voice. You have to speak. You, ha you have to tell your stories because we are all better for it. And I'll articulate this, and Joel will believe in exactly what I say. You are the future. And you are not going out there alone. All of us are behind you and beside you. So go out, write, scream, tell your story, celebrate what we've come to this very moment in history, critique it, make sure that we do not give our children and our grandchildren the things that we never did. And I'm looking at, um, when I'm me, forgive I'm, me for mispronouncing I'm looking, I'm looking at the clock and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm also cognizant that people have classes yes. and things that they have to go to teach, but I, oh, Caitlin, I, just, I want to just ask, offer you the opportunity now. You're good? Okay. 
Uh, everything got answered. Thank you so much. And, I, and I, did, I just want to add one really quick thing, too, about everything Chase said, which I, I feel like when he speaks, he's still inspiring me to, like, do more and be more. And I did want to uncouple this idea that the next generation means that you have to be young. I sort of feel like, um, you know, I think uh, the wonderful thing about creating and storytelling is that it is decoupled from physical age. You know what I mean? It is like we are all you know we theater practitioners some of us are newer to it than others but i think that when the future is ours it's like collectively whoever you are whatever your background your age whatever lives you had before you started doing theater whether it's the first thing you've ever done that i think it's like now is the time to just start you know and and be bold so i think it's for everyone and for all of us to you know we're all that next generation too right like it's it's our future too yeah, you both are really, really inspiring. Um, and um, I hate to close it out, but here we go. It's that old um, construct called time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, many thanks to George Mason School of Theater, Mason Players, Players for Change, and Friends of Theater for their support in um, publicizing and attending this event. A special shout out to our interim program director, Nick Horner, who is working over there to uh, keep the logistics on track. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Nick has also made all three of our conversations available at a link that I am told you will provide in the in the it chat. Is in the chat. Uh, it's on our link to our School of Theater page. It'll be there within the next three days. Just scroll to the bottom. You'll see a green bar. It says coming soon right under our recent news. And so please do follow up. There'd be some supplemental materials there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jola, everyone. Yep. Thank, thank, you. You, thank you, Che. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. And keep on working. Yes. And if yes. you're ever in Amherst, Massachusetts, <laughs> I have a table that, that is yours. That's I'm right. there. I'm That's there. Cool. I love it. He's <laughs> actually an alum of yeah. college on the woman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I went to Amherst College, so I will I will come visit your table. I I I, I will bug you for that yes. someday. <laughs> All right. Really Bye. incredible. Thanks to uh, Julia and to you, Che, whom I hope to see live and in person at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, and last but not least, thanks to all of you for being present today. This conversation is ongoing, and we will continue this series next semester. So everyone who has signed on for these guest artist talks will be notified once the schedule is set. Um, thank you, Joel. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. My hope is that these seeds have been planted today and that they'll take root and flourish. Thank you all.